Right, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, very warm welcome on a cold evening to the 2016 Trevor Rees Memorial Lecture. Uh, my name's Ian Henderson and I'm the director of the Menzies Centre for Australian Studies, which, within, uh, which in association with the University of London's Institute of Commonwealth Studies has hosted this annual lecture since 1984. I'd like to extend a particular heart, particularly hearty welcome on behalf of King's College London to Hilary Rees, Hilary Rees and friends. Uh, I'm also pleased that Professor Paul Pickering, Dean of the College of Arts and Social Sciences at the Australian National University, uh, can be with us this evening. I spotted him. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Hi, hey, Paul. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, let me welcome tonight's lecturer, Dr Agnieszka Sobaszynska, about whom more in a moment. The Trevor Rees Memorial Lecture celebrates the life and career of Dr Rees, a distinguished historian of the British Commonwealth and Australia, and a reader at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. He was author of Australia in the 20th Century and first editor of the Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History, an august publication now in its 44th volume. The lecture is always given by a young scholar who shows great promise of being a research leader in her field. Previous Rees lecturers have included Frank Bongiorno, Joy de Muzi, Andrew Hassam, Penny Russell, Stuart McIntyre, the Menzies Centre's own, Center's own Carl Bridge, and back in 1984, Henry Reynolds. So you get my point. There's no less a stellar career behind and ahead of tonight's Rees lecturer. Dr. Inieska Sobaszynska is a senior research fellow at the National Centre for Australian Studies at Monash University, a great friend of the Menzies Centre, and a very fine contributor to the forum which addressed the future of Australian studies here at King's two years and two weeks ago. It's a long time, isn't it? She's an historian with research specialisations in Australian relations with Asia and the intersection between popular opinion and international affairs. Her book, Visiting the Neighbours, Australians in Asia, examined the history of Australian travel to Asia from World War II to the present day, showing that travel experiences helped shape both public opinion and diplomacy toward, uh, towards the region. Currently, Dr. Sobaszynska is working on an ARC DECRA project that traces the rise and influence of developing development volunteering programs during the 1950s and 1960s, something we'll hear more about tonight. After Agnieszka speaks, uh, there will be a vote of thanks from the Menzies Centre's own Dr. Simon Simon Slight, senior lecturer in Australian history here at King's and author of Young People and the Shaping of Public Space in Melbourne, 1870 to 1914. I then invite you to join us at a reception which is just along the corridor here. Before asking Dr. Sobaszynska to take this microphone away from me, allow, a moment, I, allow me a moment to reflect upon the topic of tonight's lecture the work of the man whose name adorns it, and the calamitous events of last night. It feels like... <laughs> there we go. It feels like uh, it is an important moment, given this unlooked-for conjunction, to stand up and to say, I'm with her. And by her, I don't just mean Hillary Clinton, or indeed our beloved Hillary Rees here tonight, but I'm with her, I think, means I'm with all women tonight who have fought hard or worked quietly towards greater recognition and valuation of their contributions to politics, society, business, government, the military, creativity, and the arts. It's to, it's to say I'm with those who recognize the power and potential of sisterhood, and for this moment in this speech, that's a genderless term, and with those that understand themselves as desiring and desirable beings, uh, yet who reject with righteous anger gross sexual objectification. It means I'm with the feminists, no less, whose campaigns in the modernity we recognise as springing from the end of the 19th century, and which indeed energised all the civil rights and liberations politics of the 20th century and beyond. I think tonight we see their work as incomplete in ways that perhaps many of us had never realised. And it is to feminism that I find myself looking for answers and a new vanguard as we move into a very new and possibly a very unnerving political future. I say that as an out gay man with an eye on the predicaments of my black and Islamic friends and the First Nations peoples of my and the other nations uh, in the face of this so-called white lash. Why feminism then? Well, because women are not a minority issue, but feminism is up front and central again as we stand firm on minority rights. As I put it to myself in the early hours of this morning, head down, eyes front, 
women's rights, minority rights, democratic engagement, education, communication, respect and everyday kindness. This, I hope, will be Feminism 5, the, device, the decisive wave. It's only fitting then that I relinquish the floor to an outstanding young intellectual who just happens to be a woman. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking of beautiful humanitarians, the public faces of international development in the 1950s and 60s, please join me in welcoming Dr. Inieska Sobyszynska to deliver the 2016 Trevor Rees Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone, first of all, for coming out tonight. Um, I'm sure there are many weary eyes. I know a lot of us stayed up way too late last night, so the extra effort um, in making it out on a cold night like tonight is appreciated. Thank you also to Ian for that um, introduction. And to the Menzies Centre for Australian Studies, Simon Slight, um, and everyone at King's, this is, as Ian suggested, a tremendous honour I follow in some very, very big footsteps. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here today. This lecture is held in memory of Dr. Trevor Rees. Dr. Rees was a historian of the links between Britain, Australia and the United States, which of course is also what my work is on. From 1956 to 1962, he worked in Australia where he published um, on connections between the American and Australian colonies before returning to Britain to publish his seminal work, Australia in the 20th Century. Dr. Rees's intellectual, personal and political connections across the English speaking world were enabled by access to ever faster and increasingly affordable transport. Jet powered aircraft helped annihilate distance, allowing mail and passengers to cross the world in hours and days rather than weeks and months. Across the Western world, people had the uncanny sensation that the world was shrinking. A common refrain held that in a shrinking world, distant events could no longer be ignored. And from the early 1950s, the underdeveloped nations, as they were called, attained increasing prominence in Western public discourse. At the same time as Dr. Rees traveled between Australia and Britain, Groups of young people were pioneering a new kind of civic engagement in international affairs. Development volunteering, the practice by which relatively well-off Western youth took a year or two off to work in underdeveloped nations, began in Australia in the early 1950s before being taken up in Canada, Britain and the United States. This is the story I wish to tell tonight. It begins as a small story of youthful idealism, but as I'll illustrate tonight, by bringing ordinary people into the sphere of international relations and it, by glamorising the humanitarian image, it had far-reaching consequences. Now, over the past decade or so, historians have started to become very interested in this history of international development and foreign aid. From almost nothing, we now have a quite a rich historiography linking international development to colonial governance and tracing its high point during the 1950s and 1960s. This is what I'll be contributing to today. Now these accounts so far tend to depict an elite driven top down system largely devised by American economists and British colonial bureaucrats. Joseph Hodge, I think, historian Joseph Hodge, sums it up perhaps best of all in the title of his book, International Development Was the Triumph of the Expert, he says. Despite the recognition that a more public-facing foreign aid system, characterised by NGOs and celebrity activists, later emerged, most scholarship on development in the 1950s and 60s remains firmly focused on politicians, on academics and on technical experts. Now tonight I'll be putting forward a different story in which ordinary people came to have agency within the international system. Rather than the triumph of the expert, I'll put to you that the 1950s and 60s saw a growing popular interest and involvement of ordinary people and particularly youth in international development. Their participation in turn shaped a great deal of, uh, sorry, attracted a great deal of media attention which ended up shaping mainstream images of international development. The question of how ordinary people came to imagine global poverty and international development, I argue, 
is intimately entwined with this history of development volunteering. So tonight's story begins not in Washington DC or Whitehall, but at the Student Union of Melbourne University. It is 1950 and 21 year old political science student Herb Feith has just heard the report of a delegation to a student conference in Bombay. Now what interested him wasn't the conference itself, but what had happened on the way, on the uh, boat during the long days at sea. During those long days, two Melbourne University students had struck up an acquaintance with the Indonesian delegate, who'd given a vivid account of his nation's recent revolution and the chronic skills shortage that followed Indonesia's declaration of independence in 1945. Now Herb Feith, he was one of your classic doers. He's a Jewish refugee from Austria who had a very strong, deep-seated belief that ordinary people had a moral responsibility to become involved in the creation of a better world. He thought that perhaps young Australians could help ameliorate this skills shortage by spending a couple of years working in Indonesia at Indonesian rates of pay. He began to, play, to plan the Volunteer Graduate Scheme, or VGS as it came to be called, and was put in touch with Molly Bondan, who some of you may have heard of, a Sydney cider who'd married an Indonesian revolutionary during the war and had settled in Jakarta. With her husband's connections, Bondan had begun to work for the Ministry of Information, and she was sure she could help organise a job for Fief and for any other interested Australians who wanted to help Indonesia's development as an independent nation, and that was very important to them. So within a matter of months from having this very first idea, Herb Feith arrived in Jakarta. His fare had been paid for by Melbourne University, but as promised, Molly had organised him a job. Back in Melbourne, people began to hear about this and talk about it, and enthusiasm ran quite high amongst um, fellow students, particularly those in the student Christian movement. And in 1952, two more volunteers bacteriologist uh, Gwenda Rodder and radio engineer Ollie McMichael, who unfortunately I don't have a photo of, arrived. By the time they began work, VGS had attracted government support. From 1952, the Australian government paid volunteers first class fares to and from Indonesia and provided them with equipment and resettlement grants. Volunteers' salaries were paid by the Indonesian government and this made the Australian and Indonesian governments, through this cooperation, the first to support a secular volunteering program that framed its aims around development, as it was called. Now, also during these early years, the VGS shifted from being that work scheme that I introduced, designed to fulfil a skills shortage, to become a political statement. Even before disembarking in Jakarta, Feith had begun to think that the gesture value of these projects, meaning, quote, the motive rather than the immediate practical effect, was all important. Rather than the work itself, he began to think that the most important task of Australian volunteers was identification and, quote, concrete manifestation of colour equality views in a country where whites have just never done any work. This ideal of identification became really the central point of VGS quite quickly. An early pamphlet noted, what they do in their actual work is important, but more important perhaps is the fact that these young people assert by the way they live that racial equality is real. By having natural and friendly relations with Indonesians on a basis of mutual respect, they helped to do away with the colonial legacy of mistrust and misunderstanding, which to so large an extent continues to affect relations between coloured people and whites. This was emphasised by the volunteers themselves, who claimed that our most important job in Indonesia, more important even than what we do at work, is just to live normally and naturally in the Indonesian world and to make friends among Indonesians showing Indonesians that there are whites who don't stand on superiority ideas and making whites ashamed of the privileges they continue to enjoy. This is interesting because there's obviously a clear tension between that original purpose, which is to fill a skills shortage, that is to do a job, and this second idea, um, which shows that what the work that they did was actually less important than the image they conveyed. This tension, 
between the day-to-day -day experience of volunteers, their job, and their image is a thread that runs throughout the history of development volunteering. But this fact, this idea that volunteers would be living as Indonesians was the focus of early media coverage. This was what really caught people's attention. This was emphasised because it was unusual. So newspaper articles such as this began to focus on the fact that, um, as this one says, an Adelaide man lived as an Indonesian. Now this was emphasised because it was unusual. Since the 19th century, Australians in Asia had associated themselves quite strongly with the colonisers rather than the colonised. In my last book, which I'm sorry, shamelessly plugging, um, Visiting the Neighbours, Australians in Asia, I found that most Australian travellers had a very keen eye on colonial pre uh, prestige and European racial prestige and that they worked hard to maintain this illusion of superiority in Asian eyes. And that was the case until at least the late 1950s. Now, it's important to note that even at this early stage, the media also focused almost exclusively on the volunteers and the special characteristics that made them want to take up this work, rather than addressing Indonesia or the context of international development, or even how their work actually contributed to Indonesia's growth. Instead, typical reports painted the young volunteers as a new sort of kind of national hero um, who subjugated their own comfort and career advancement in service of Australia's reputation. And that was, of course, exactly the point. The White Australia policy had created a serious image problem in Asia that VGS wanted to address. Whilst the original idea had, of course, come from an Indonesian suggestion and saw Indonesia benefiting from the cheap skilled labour, before long, the volunteer graduate scheme was largely focused on improving Australia's image in Asia. Now, this media coverage, which I'm showing you, wasn't very extensive. Members of VGS had quite a complicated attitude towards publicity. On the one hand, they realised that they needed to publicise their scheme if they were going to have more recruits. They also sensed that, quote, as part of the nation's small corporate conscience, we need publicity because publicity makes public opinion, as we've seen only too clearly over the last few days. On the other hand, however, VGS worried that too much publicity could embarrass the Indonesians by exposing their relative poverty and their need for foreign help. As Herb Feith wrote in 1961, the scheme has to some extent consciously shunned publicity, lest Indonesians come to regard it as another Western effort that we're supposed to be grateful for. So the result was strictly limited exposure to the media. Articles, and most of which I'll actually show you tonight, there's so few, articles look like this unillustrated, informative pieces that describe the ideals and practicalities of this scheme, which will contrast with what I'll be showing you later. The closest that VGS really ever came to glamour was this, um, this 1954 article in The Sun, which captured volunteer Alison Frankel returning from Indonesia with what, with what The Sun blithely called a coolie hat. Now, although they were not visually appealing, this publicity made some significant moral claims. Articles such as this one from um, uh, the Argus in 1955 claimed that Australians helped to build new Indonesia. Writing in the Argus in 1956, influential journalist um, Peter Russo claimed that VGS was one of the most important um, ways in which Australia could improve its image in Asia. Sorry, this is the Melbourne age. This coming one is the Argus. If there is any better way of dispelling Asia's lingering distrust of colonial taints, he wrote, I have not heard of it. If there's any better way than, of sh than, th than that of showing the flag in Asia, I have not heard of it. Rather than models of post-colonialism or agents for modernisation, Russo thought VGS volunteers were, quote, our leading insurance salesmen in Asia. Now, this image projected by VGS 
earnest youth combating Australian prejudice and spurning Western comforts to live with and as Indonesians was a runaway success in both Australia and Indonesia. By 1955, Australia's Department of External Affairs had nothing but praise, writing that, quote, in our view, the scheme tapped a useful source of energetic talent from which we profited at a cheap rate. It also used volunteers in its very nascent and quite amateur um, public diplomacy campaigns in the mid-1950s, which were mostly directed towards improving Australia's image in Asia. Now, this image was also appealing beyond Australia. VGS, as I've explained, came into existence as a solution to specifically Australian and Indonesian problems. However, from the very beginning, it hoped to spread the model of development volunteering beyond this context, um, thinking it, quote, desirable that the symbolic value of the scheme in terms of racial equality should not just be limited to one country. In the same month that he arrived in Indonesia, before he'd really barely unpacked, Herb Feith wrote to the Australian Association for the United Nations to propose that his experience serve as, quote, a forerunner of other possible similar ventures in other parts of Southeast Asia, possibly in cooperation with UN agencies. He thought that Australian graduates can pioneer the way for students of other nationalities. So from this very beginning, we had a real surge um, and a real desire to, put, uh, to begin programs in other parts of the world. To this end, VGS uh, lobbied other Western nations to begin similar programs. From early 1951, contact was initiated with New Zealand organisations, including the New Zealand University Student Association and the Student Christian Movement. Within a couple of years, and due to some sort of fortuitous circumstances along the way, the New Zealand Volunteer Graduate Scheme was formally established, funded by the NZ government, but interestingly enough, actually um, administered by this Australian group, the Australian VGS. Then in 1954, young Canadian Lewis Perenbam heard of the Australian scheme and decided to try and set up a similar program in Canada. Perenbam visited, visited Indonesia in 1955, hoping to set up an arrangement. But within a couple of years, he decided actually that Ghana would be a more appropriate receiving nation. Ghana was in the Commonwealth, which would make this an easier sell politically. And it was on the cusp of decolonisation. As Perenbam wrote to the Canadian government, quote, arising from the Australian experience, it is suggested that a similar program be established with Ghana in whose progress and prosperity Canada is greatly interested. This would ultimately result in the establishment of CUSO, or Canadian University Service Overseas, of which Perenbam became um, founding executive director in 1961, and which, as you see, this is their current website. It's still one of the major um, development volunteering programs in the world. Now, in 1957, VGS also began corresponding with Alec Dixon, who later went on to establish Britain's VSO, or Voluntary Service Overseas, which I'm sure many of you have heard. Dixon had initially um, started contact with the Australians through his brother, who was Director of Education in the British colony of Sarawak, later part of Malaysia. He wrote to VGS to explain that Alec Dixon was anxious to develop something of the kind in the United Kingdom for voluntary service overseas by young people. VSO was launched the following year, so 1958, and it, again, is a major organisation at the moment. Um, it's sent over 40,000 Britons to developing nations so far. And if I had more time, I would talk much more about um, VSO because I've just spent the past week in their archives and it's absolutely fascinating. But unfortunately, I won't bore you with that today. Or well, unfortunately for me, maybe fortunately for you. But above all other countries, VGS hoped to expand to the United States. In 1957, Herb Feith left to pursue a PhD at Cornell University, and he embarked on a vigorous lobbying campaign during his time in the US. He wrote dozens of letters and met a range of influential Americans, urging them to send volunteers not only to Indonesia, but also to other parts of Asia and Africa. 
In a letter to the American Committee on Africa, for example, he encouraged, quote, American-African parallels to the Australian-Indonesian volunteer graduate scheme noting that not only it was Africa in similar need of trained expertise, but that, quote, an American-African scheme of the type I'm envisaging would draw its strength in part from a sense of guilt about the national past, which is similar to that experienced by young Australians. Now, the Peace Corps, which was established in 1961, didn't cite VGS as its immediate inspiration. The Americans preferred to see it as a US ideal, as you'll see in just a moment. But it was nonetheless strongly influenced by it. John F. Kennedy commissioned two research reports on overseas volunteering programs before firming up his plans for the Peace Corps. These reports directly drew on Britain's VSO and Canada's QSO, as well as several American proposals that had already been inspired by VGS. And several of Kennedy's advisors also knew Herb Feith personally from his time at Cornell. So VGS might have invented the model of development volunteering, but the Peace Corps was the one that brought it really to mainstream attention. Kennedy first uttered the words Peace Corps in early November while still a presidential candidate. Two months later, a Gallup poll found that 89% of Americans had heard of the Peace Corps with 71% in favour, which is really quite astronomical. Within months, Kennedy's office had been inundated with more than 40,000 letters about the Peace Corps, with more people applying to work for the as yet non-existent agency than for the rest of government put together. Over the following years, the United States Peace Corps captured the public's ima imagination in a way that few issues of any kind, let alone in international development, ever did. Now, both JFK and the director of the Peace Corps, his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, were very well aware of the boost that came from popular support. Both were, if nothing else, taskmasters at cultivating a glamorous image. Unlike VGS, they set out for maximum publicity. As one of his very first tasks, Shriver put together a large publicity team which poached talent from both Hollywood and Madison Avenue to work for the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps message was carried in hundreds of posters and pamphlets, and this is just a couple of examples, um, as well as countless advertisements in national, regional and college newspapers. Um, and also in dozens of films that Shriver uh, commissioned, which were screened on national television and at hundreds of university campuses and high schools across the US. Shriver himself was very telegenic. He was very, he's quite famously handsome. And he also maintained a punishing schedule of news and current affairs shows, as well as radio programs. The publicity profile that he sort of began and that he maintained was unusual for, for the head of a government agency and for a government agency in general. And it helped sustain that high initial public enthusiasm over the coming years. In addition to um, this formal publicity, the Peace Corps also attracted a huge amount of media attention in the United States, but also around the world. The vast majority of this coverage was positive, absolutely glowingly positive, in a way that we probably wouldn't be used to nowadays. So much so that Hollywood producer Michael Abbott thought that the Peace Corps was, quote, without doubt, the most potent public relations tool ever devised. The Peace Corps was a subject of countless articles in newspapers and magazines, as well as featuring on television and radio quite frequently. In the US, it received almost saturation coverage during the, these first few years, with every new deployment of volunteers attracting its own uh, set of articles and a new round of publicity. In Britain and Australia, it also attracted quite a lot of attention and a lot of publicity, to the extent that um, people began to pressure the governments to begin their own Peace Corps ironically forgetting or not even realising that Australia and Britain had actually had their own programs which had inspired the Peace Corps in the first place. Now this constant stream of publicity contributed to what anthropologist Robert Texter at the time called the Peace Corps mystique, by which the program had a direct, fresh, personal appeal, he wrote, to many Americans, to millions of Americans rather. <clears throat> 
almost uniquely for an international development program at this time, the Peace Corps also intersected with popular culture. It was portrayed in plays, novels, in cartoons, television sitcoms and game shows. In 1962, for example, the popular Patty Duke show ran an episode in which the teenage Patty secretly signs up for the Peace Corps in Africa. In the same year, the Gertrude Burke show also aired an episode featuring a Peace Corps plotline. So exceptionally for a, for a government agency, I'd argue, the Peace Corps acquired mainstream pop culture glamour. Even celebrities flocked to be associated with the Peace Corps. The United Nations had begun to use celebrity ambassadors um, and goodwill ambassadors to promote their programs from 1954 in the hope that their profile and glamour might rub off on the rather, rather sombre topic of global poverty. The Peace Corps, by contrast, was placed in the unusual and enviable position of being pursued by act actors, athletes and other celebrities who hoped that the Peace Corps' glamour might rub off on them. A young Clint Eastwood wrote to President Kennedy, for example, in March 1961, offering to create what he called, quote, a volunteer entertainment group to supplement the work of the Peace Corps. Now, at this time, Eastwood was already famous. He starred in Rawhide, which was among the most popular television shows at the time. So that meant that the letter was prioritised and people began to discuss it. If you can see the sort of margin notes, what should we do about this Eastwood proposal? But ultimately, the Peace Corps turned Eastwood down. Other notable individuals, among them um, singer Harry Belafonte, football stars, athletes, even anthropologist Margaret Mead offered their own suggestions and their own profile um, to the Peace Corps. So how did all this publicity depict the Peace Corps and why are the images they portrayed important or why do I think they are important? As with VGS, uh, coverage overwhelmingly focused on the volunteers themselves rather than on the job or on the broader context of development. A good deal of publicity presented the Peace Corps as an answer to the ugly American who'd become infamous following the publication of Lederer and Burdick's 1958 novel, of which many of you I'm sure know, and which eventually became a um, film starring Marlon Brando. Now, in the novel The Ugly American, the neo-colonial behaviour of American diplomats and aid workers was contrasted with the grassroots ap approach of Soviet aid workers, who won villages over by speaking the language and making friends among the locals. Many people thought that the Peace Corps was America's answer. In the words of one Hollywood producer and publicist, the Peace Corps, um, far from ugly Americans, the Peace Corps would be, quote, beautiful Americans, bringing hope and trust and self-esteem. We see this trope of the beautiful American over and over again. In coverage, for, uh, for example, of Iran volunteer Barclay Moore, who served in Iran for five years from 1966. When he returned, the National Observer profiled Moore in an article you see here titled The Beautiful American. It portrayed Moore in superhuman terms. He was, quote, able to move people to accomplish what they said was impossible. One former supervisor was quoted as saying, he's the only person I've ever met who makes you want to say, I'll follow you anywhere. Even into the 1970s then, amid rising opposition to America's overseas interventions, the image of Peace Corps volunteers as beautiful Americans was still enduring. However, publicity focused on Peace Corps volunteers' beauty in a literal sense too. Unlike reporting on many international issues, and in stark contrast to that VGS publicity I was showing you before, which was quite bland, the Peace Corps was a visual phenomenon. Articles and even books on the Peace Corps were liberally illustrated and almost all of the photographs were focused on volunteers, training, at work or at leisure. The mainstream press regularly portrayed the Peace Corps as beautiful Americans, quite literally. Hilda S. B. Cole's 1962 um, article in the Atlantic Monthly, which you see here, was based on a visit to the Peace Corps training camp in Puerto Rico. It illustrated with photographs of a young, blonde female volunteer abseiling, 
the article claimed that volunteers must be sturdy, have the skills of pioneers and a proud team spirit. Now the relationship between abseiling and a volunteer posting in a Filipino school to take one of the early um, most common uh, positions was always quite problematic, obviously. And internally program directors worried that the jungle, jungle camp experience produced volunteers who verged on arrogant, which quote, is exactly the opposite of the humility which should be the hallmark of a good volunteer. Nonetheless, this training formed a core element in the, that public imaging of the Peace Corps, as you'll see, reproduced in numerous articles. This image of fit, attractive young Americans tra training to take on the world was endlessly reproduced. Now, of course, not every Peace Corps volunteer was young and beautiful. Even 60-something volunteers were not unheard of. But you wouldn't know it from looking at the media and publicity portrayal of the Peace Corps during these early years, which had a particular focus on young, good-looking women. 1968 saw the release of a pictorial collection called the Peace Corps Experience. Part of the collection was devoted to a photo essay titled The Peace Corps, uh, sorry, Pretty Girls, The Peace Corps Has Its Share. Running over four pages, this depicted 10 female volunteers teaching classes in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. The text accompanying the photographs claimed that, quote, everybody remembers falling in love with a pretty young teacher at one time or another in their school days, and the boys who have Peace Corps teachers will no doubt face the same hazards. Quite apart from questions of taste, this coverage, co uh, covered, this coverage carried underlying messages. Depictions of attractive volunteers with whom locals no doubt fall in love suggested that American development intervention was eagerly desired. The absence of genuine local voices speaking for themselves rather than having their desires ventriloquized by American writers left little room for contradiction. Focusing on female beauty, the Peace Corps experience here presented volunteers as appealing counterpoints to the ugly American in every way. Now, the media's preference for attractive, glamorous women can perhaps be best illustrated by following one of these women and her media career. This volunteer, Janet Hanneman. Hanneman was a 25-year-old nurse from Kansas when she volunteered for the Peace Corps in 1962. She was one of 4,000 volunteers sent overseas that year, but her profile in the media was entirely disproportionate to those numbers. Tall and striking, she caught the eye of photographers even before departure. The New York Post ran this image of her undertaking training um, at the Puerto Rico camp in March 1962. The official Peace Corps newsletter ran a different photo of Janet taking at the same time, which you see here, and I'm sorry about the quality of the reproduction, and she was also part of a photo essay in a 1963 um, paperback edition, paperback library edition on the Peace Corps. So these are quite cheap um, mass production uh, paperbacks. But it was after training, when she began her role as a psychiatric nurse in Pakistan, that Janet's profile really took off. An official Peace Corps photographer followed Janet over several days, taking roll after roll of photographs. The images were clearly striking, portraying Janet as worldly, compassionate and glamorous at the same time. Her appropriation of Pakistani clothing and jewellery was particularly emphasised. Um, and every photograph depicted Hanuman as composed and stylish no matter what she faced. That year, her photographs appeared over six pages in the official Peace Corps report, which itself wasn't all that long. She also featured in um, the Kansas City Times, which you see in a very, very poor reproduction, I'm afraid, on the left. And a different set of photographs illustrated an article in the American Journal of Nursing, which doesn't normally tend to sort of have highly pictorial articles. Before long, her time in the Peace Corps became the subject of a multi-page photo essay in the Rotarian, which you can see here, which opened by introducing her as pretty Han Janet Hanneman of the Peace Corps. And upon her return, the major national circulation, Life magazine, profiled Hanneman in a piece on the so-called re-entry crisis, so how it feels to come back. 
Now this coverage is obviously interesting in its gender, in its gender politics. Scholars, including Molly Geidel, have looked at the Peace Corps as a masculinist fantasy and that sort of physical hardiness and unconventionality suggested by travel to Latin America and Africa certainly fit in a certain boy's own image. So why were women so prominent in media coverage? On the one hand, I'd say, this did in, to some extent reflect reality as nearly half of the Peace Corps were actually um, women many of them seeing it as an opportunity to escape the very strict gender roles demanded by middle-class life in 1960s America, or to get a whole new range of travel experiences before settling down to those gender roles. But I'd argue that coverage like this uh, wasn't really depicting a feminist reality. After all, few volunteers looked like Janet Hanneman, and those who did didn't really have the same media profile. Instead, depicting the Peace Corps as an attractive woman put an appealing face on the spread of American power and on development politics in general. To use Mar Mary Louise Pratt's terms, the Peace Corps narrated a story of anti-conquest that camouflaged the spread of Western hegemony. By the early 1960s, the Cold War had gone global and American Russia battled for influence in the Third World. These battles were both military, and it's important to remember that the United States already had advisers in Vietnam um, at the start of the Peace Corps in 1961, and strategic. The Peace Corps was one of a suite of programs designed to win the hearts and minds of people um, in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Its spread was very closely tied to US economic, military, and cultural power portraying this power as an attractive proposition and representing America as a pretty young woman with whom local boys would no doubt fall in love with, papered over the hard edges of American and broader Western influence and narrated a story in which US power was not only benign, but vehemently desired. Moreover, this fixation on attractive volunteers meant that relatively little attention was devoted to the other side of the equation that is the people and places receiving Peace Corps volunteers. Rather than engaging with or in fact explaining the concept and aims of development or with the histories, cultures and economies of Africa, Asia and Latin America, Peace Corps publicity suggested, uh, sorry, presented an oversimplified account of virtuous modern Americans helping sluggish backward nations. Focusing on volunteers meant that too often the underdeveloped world was portrayed as an empty slate upon which the Peace Corps could inscribe its achievements. In 1962, The New Yorker, a magazine, interviewed Harris Wofford, special representative for the Peace Corps in Africa. In an article titled Pioneers, Wofford claimed that, quote, the greatest future for the Peace Corps is in Africa because it's so wide open and limited only by our imagination. It's an empty continent. He went on, you get a feeling that must be like what the people who first saw America felt. They're starting out on a clean slate. Now such publicity was far removed from reality. Rather than pioneers starting out with a clean slate, most Peace Corps volunteers were placed in established communities. The largest number was employed as teachers, offering delivering existing cu uh, curricula in established schools. And many volunteers were based in cities and enjoyed at least some modern comforts. Yet neither the publicity nor the media acknowledged this fact, instead preferring to portray volunteers as pioneers in this ambiguous category of underdeveloped nations. Removing any specific context and focusing on the volunteers themselves allowed the media to often run with crude assumptions. Many reports assumed that volunteers would live in mud huts in rural villages, far from civilization. A common trope removed them even further. Cole Espy, whose article you saw before, the young girl abseiling, thought that the distance between America and underdeveloped countries was so great that it could only be expressed in temporal rather than geographical terms. She depicted the Peace Corps volunteers as having gone, quote, backwards in time so that they grappled with the realities of life in primitive places. Cole Espy's depiction of underdeveloped nations as backwards in time 
was echoed in numerous reports. The Complete Peaceful Guide from 1961 claimed that the Peace Corps served in parts of the world where history has not happened. The paperback library edition of the Peace Corps wrote of volunteers serving in places where time seemed to have stopped. This idea that volunteers worked in backwards, primitive places, papered obviously over, um, over local agency, it also exaggerated the extent of volunteers' discomfort on their postings, making their surface, uh, service appear as a sacrifice. Time magazine profiled the Peace Corps in a cover story in July 1963. This is where you say that it's a US ideal abroad. This article was well aware of the widespread image of the Peace Corps as beautiful Americans and began ironically um, by noting that from the front porters of the US, quote, the view of the Peace Corps is beautiful insofar as the image is, image is that of a battalion of cheery crew cut kids who have all but won the Cold War through the application of good old American know-how. However, Time wrote, as so often happens, the image is glossier than the reality. Instead of glamour, the article depicted volunteers who'd been, quote, racked by illness and bedded down in squalor, and who wrestled with tongue-twisting languages and gagged on in incredible foods containing everything from cat meat to sheep intestines to fish heads. They had also, quote, cursed the mistakes of their superiors and muttered in fury at the ignorance and inertia of the natives they are trying to help. Now, exaggerating the difficulty of their postings only served to further entrench the Peace Corps mystique. Time fetishised the dif difficulties faced by Peace Corps volunteers in order to counter criticism that a kiddie corps, as it was called, would be unable to face the tough reality of underdevelopment. The Peace Corps experience may have been rough, Time thought, but the reality is more meaningful than the unflawed popular image. As with official PR, Time's measure of success was on American terms. Ultimately, Time said, the Peace Corps was a triumph, as, quote, in scores of small ways, through, the, through their own zeal and ingenuity, the Peace Corps men have made a disproportionate number of friends for the US. Because of this, time decreed it probably the single greatest success the Kennedy administration has produced. Now, in articles such as this, volunteering in Africa, Asia and Latin America was presented less as development work and more as a humanitarian sacrifice that merited the respect and gratitude of the American nation. A 1966 New York Post profile of Kenya volunteer uh, Philip Schaefer emphasised the difficulties of Peace Corps service in order to heighten veneration for volunteers. Titled Peace Veteran, the article claimed that volunteers were, quote, exposed to various forms of disease and danger and rendered a form of distinguished service under a special kind of emotional fire. Schaefer had been through two rough years, um, it wrote, the New York Post wrote, so much so that one can only imagine how much private trial he has survived or how much hidden strength he's discovered on this journey. In articles such as this, Peace Corps service was rendered into the moral equivalent of war. But, the New York Post wrote, let no one suggest that they had a soft, easy time on these lonely fronts. In a better hour, they may be accorded some of the honours now reserved for the valiance of the battlefield. Now, coverage such as this rendered the Peace Corps volunteer into a figure that was not only altruistic and humanitarian, not only beautiful, as we've seen so far, but also brave and heroic. So what does all this mean? Scholars, including Lily Huliaraki and Christina Toomey, have pointed to the importance of photography in constructing humanitarian sentiments. They argue that images help construct a global public with a disposition to engage with and care for distant others. Yet what's interesting in this publicity is that distant suffering was rarely displayed. In fact, locals hardly featured at all. And when they did, it was usually to provide an exotic background to the image of a Western volunteer. Peace Corps publicity endlessly reproduced the image of um, admirable and glamorous Western volunteers and position them as role models or aspirational figures for other Westerners. Rather than encouraging public, publics to care for distant others or enrich the lives of distant others, 
Such imagery suggested viewers should become involved in foreign aid because it would render them into more exotic and glamorous versions of themselves. Moreover, by looking at volunteering and presenting volunteering as a sacrifice, such coverage portrayed volunteers as beautiful humanitarians rather than as agents for development and or Western hegemony. This is, of course, an important distinction. Development in the 50s and 60s, as it is today, was linked to geopolitics, with the communist and capitalist blocs competing for influence across the unaligned or third world. Humanitarianism, on the other hand, was related to emergency assistance and disaster relief, and was linked to compassion and altruism rather than politics. My argument today is that this distinction became blurred in the popular image or imagery of development volunteering. The Peace Corps presented development volunteers as idealistic and altruistic humanitarians, and this was further simplified in popular culture. The Peace Corps episode of the Paddy Duke show I mentioned before, for example, saw young Paddy dreamily liken Peace Corps volunteers to, quote, the great humanitarians, Albert Schweitzer, Clara Barton, Betsy Ross. You might also remember that at the beginning of Dirty Dancing, Baby couldn't wait to join the Peace Corps because she wanted to change the world for the better. This sort of imaging presented a narrative of anti-conquest, even as America became a global hegemon. hegemon. It also contributed to the commodification of the aid worker as a beautiful humanitarian, which we've seen so clearly in the images of Janet Hanneman, and which became firmly established in popular culture in subsequent decades. There was one further effect. Rendering volunteers into beautiful humanitarians papered over some troubling undercurrents, many of which are still with us today. By placing inexperienced young volunteers, often in positions of some authority, organisations such as VGS, VSO and the Peace Corps implied that people from developed nations were capable of uplifting developing ones simply by their presence rather than because of any technical skills. This assumption not only located Western society as the ultimate end point of development, but suggested that underdevelopment and poverty were the result of a backward or traditional state of mind. Introducing a bright, enthusiastic young Westerner, the thinking went, would encourage a competitive, individualistic state of mind and get rid of the traditional communal and cooperative pra practices that had kept the place underdeveloped. This in turn would kickstart the economy, building growth from the bottom up and creating the conditions for economic takeoff on a national scale. Now, while this kind of thinking was consonant with modernization theory, it's left us with some troubling uh, legacies. The assumptions it supported of Westerners as enthusiastic go-getters and poorer communities as stagnant and backwards shifted blame away from structural inequality from the legacies of colonialism and the continued unfairness of global trade system and placed this blame on the shoulders of the poor. The clear winner in this scenario was not the developing world, but rather the Western volunteer who could bask in the glow of being a beautiful humanitarian. And that's where I'll leave you tonight. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, and it's my pleasure now to offer a response to Agnieszka's terrific 2016 Rees Memorial Lecture before uh, offering a vote of thanks on behalf of us all and ushering in the next part of the evening. And I'd like to begin my response with an email. Not one of those Hillary emails, but a history email. <laughs> Alas, the two things are now closely related. But I digress. Each Friday in the history department here at King's, all staff and students receive an e-newsletter, alerting us to upcoming events and pointing out available opportunities. Last week, I must admit to a wry smile in seeing four items listed quite closely in the bulletin. The first concerned Dr. Sobyshinska's talk tonight. The second and third advertised a decolonization workshop and a separate three-day conference on global inequality, divided history, and just underneath in the newsletter appeared a fourth notice, inviting students, I don't make this up, to enrol in the International Student Volunteers Programme for 2017. 
and to take the opportunity to travel out to countries including South Africa, Thailand, New Zealand and Australia in order to help, so the promotional blurb promised in a flurry of capital letters, impact our world. As we uh, now know from tonight's lecture, such um, programmes and the complicated ambitions with which they engage have a long and perhaps surprising heritage. Reversing those old stereotypes of imperial cause leading aberrant colonial peripheries, in the case of the volunteer graduate scheme and its successors, here again is an example of Australia offering an innovation subsequently adapted elsewhere. But there's much more to the story than this finding, important as it is. In a contemporary moment of hardening border controls, we've learned, for instance, of the pivotal role played by a refugee arrival in Australia, seeking to benefit his adopted community as well as people in more humble circumstances overseas. We've learned as well of the links in the minds of politicians and diplomats between volunteering and the assertion of soft power. And we've learned about the idea of historical debt as a motivation for, chari for charitable enterprise. A motivation, one might add, which was projected with fanfare overseas rather than channeled closer to home to the Native American reservations in the US. Um, or to the historically disenfranchised, disenfranchised Indigenous communities in Australia. In a nice link to last year's lecture on sentimental masculinity by Melissa Belanta, we've also encountered in Agnieszka's talk the crossover via the chisel-jawed Clint Eastwood, no less, as well as through references to the anticipated inculcation of pioneering qualities, we've encountered the crossover between Peace Corps ambitions and youth conducting so-called tours of duty and returning home as veterans in the eyes of the media. All of this links in turn, of course, to older notions of the so-called civilising mission. And to that end, I wondered about the presence or absence of religion in this narrative and whether there was any overlap with the activities and sites of missionary organisation. Quite rightly, Agnieszka has also probed the lexicon of volunteering associated with overseas endeavour. I've long been troubled by the continued projection of categories of developed and underdeveloped nations, finding the labels merely a more respectable version of 19th century ideas of the civilised and the savage. That Africa was imagined, in the US at least, as some form of terra nullius, land belonging to no one, is also troubling doubly so when twinned with what we've heard about um, notions of so-called native inertia. It would be interesting to know more about the accounts penned by Agnieszka's youthful volunteers. How, one might ask, did they depict those they encountered abroad? And I understand that just this week, the VSO has at last opened its archive with Agnieszka the first person inside to apply her scholarly eye and indeed her camera phone, to what lies within. So we'll doubtless see more developments on this, on this aspect of the volunteer experience in due course. And what of those recipients of charitable enterprise? Was it the case, as Graham Davison identified for Australians in a recent Menzies lecture here at King's, that the idea of the overseas odyssey could trump the actual doings once in situ on the ground? Certainly in terms of the volunteer graduate scheme, that would fit with the aims of an older forerunner, the 1900s Young Australia League, an organisation which arranged overseas tours to Europe and the US as part of a goal to promote, and I quote, education through travel. As well as wondering about the diary entries of travellers, uh, the views of hosts would deepen our understanding further too. What did they think of what we might cast as the temporary locals in their midst? Such, such exchanges would offer another slant on sociologist Avta Bra's conceptions of what she calls the diaspora space, a space not only inhabited by incomers, but equally by those who are constructed as indigenous, and also her conception of cartographies of intersectionality, in which entanglements of gender, ethnicity, class, age, and sexuality are all bound up within a specific location. 
And finally, I think desire has also been central to what we've heard in the talk, it seems to me. Notions of desire, desire to be like the more glamorous volunteers, desire to gain experiences, desire to travel and desire to do good underpin much of this developing tale. I could go on, given that there are so many interesting lines of inquiry in what we've just heard. But such aspects and queries that you might have can wait till our drinks reception, at which point you'll have the opportunity to catch a word or two with our speaker and pitch any questions that you might have. For now, all that remains is for me to direct you in a moment along the corridor to that reception and firstly to ask you to join me in a very well-deserved round of applause for Dr Agnieszka Sobaszynska, this year's Rees Lecturer. Thank you. <laughs>